There have been countless instances of motorcycle manufacturers trying to re-energize a given segment of motorcycling through the implementation of new tech, new features, or general manufacturing advancements. But unfortunately, sometimes these developments and the bikes in which they debuted kind of fail. They fall short of expectations and ultimately prove too costly to produce or too complicated to own. The bikes in which these developments are built upon usually have short production windows and fall into obscurity. Other times, new advancements are a smashing success that lead to industry wide progress that have shaped the trajectory of motorcycles as we've come to know it. So on today's episode of Yammy Noob, let's take a look at 10 motorcycle fails and wins. Let's get into it. So before we do, you know we love to give away motorcycles at yammynoob.co. We've given away dozens over the years. So we figured being winter time and all, it's a little bit cold, the Hayabusa's are in hibernation, there would be no better time to switch it up a bit. So for two weeks only, we're giving away a brand new gaming PC. This thing is a beast. It's a ready to ship model from Origin that I purchased. Cost about $4,500, which is way more than I'd want to spend for a PC. It's got an RTX 4090, 64 gigs of RAM, and an Intel 14th generation processor that is just ridiculous. Oh, yeah, it's also liquid cooled, so you can max this thing out and play anything you want. Every dollar spent at Yamini.co gets you entered to win this computer. Literally pick up anything you want at the store, you will get entered to win. So just imagine, you could have a brand new rig with which to post anime on our Discord server or make wretched memes to curse the internet or play Ride 5 and cry because you can't ride because it's icy outside. This promotion's only going till the end of January, so don't sleep on it. Go and check out some parts for riding gear in the anticipation of the coming riding season and get entered to win an awesome new computer. All right, let's get into the video. Bail. In the early 1990s, Yamaha was set on bringing something novel to the world of motorcycling. In a world where standard telescopic forks with advanced adjustability was, and still is, the benchmark for quality handling, Yamaha decided they felt it could be improved upon. Not because anybody asked for it, but simply to prove that they could. They wanted to create a new standard in world-class riding, but instead, the world got the GST-1000. There had been a few small-scale examples of alternative suspension designs in motorcycling prior to the development of this machine. Elf Racing found success with their Elf 3 race bike in MotoGP in the 80s. This bike built upon a Honda NS500 used an innovative hub-centered steering and suspension system. Bespoke Italian motorcycle designers Bimota used similar tech on their highly limited Tezzi motorcycle as well. And it looks crazy. It looks like there's like a front swing arm on that thing. But it wasn't until the early 90s that Yamaha sought to bring this technology to large-scale production. The GST1000 was unique not just for its hub steering front suspension, but for its Omega frame design as well. Named after the Greek letter, the frame was essentially an aluminum box that wrapped around the engine onto which the front and suspension rears were bolted onto. In theory, with this frame design and suspension system, the handling would be state-of-the-art because the front suspension system allowed the steering function to be separate from the suspension and without the need for steering heads. The frame in the center of gravity could be lowered, but that wasn't exactly the case for the GST. It handled well by most metrics, but it behaved differently than a standard motorcycle when cornering. It was almost as if there was a disconnect between the handlebar and the front wheel. And despite its futuristic frame suspension and overall design, the riding experience did not justify the $13,000 price tag, which at the time you could forward practically any top-line sport touring bike or super bike that you wanted that offered similar or better power, similar features like fuel injection or ABS, and similar, albeit conventional handling. I'm sure riders had reservations about servicing this thing as well, given there was no existing precedent in the entire market. The Yamaha GST was sold only in 1993 and 1994 and discontinued entirely in 1999. But that's not to say that systems that separate suspension and handling were popular. You see stuff like the Goldwing or even the BMW's telelever suspension. There are some odd funky front ends on motorcycles nowadays. Win. I guess we can back that up in terms of our history of motorcycle innovation and talk about some major wins for the industry. What we now consider commonplace on motorcycles were huge milestones for two-wheel transportation in the 1980s, the first of which being fuel injection. Of course, anyone who's ever had to start their carbureted motorcycle on a cold morning recognizes the added convenience of a fuel injection, not having to worry about a choke or, God forbid, starter fluid when your old girl just doesn't want to wake up in the morning. But fuel injection had a substantial impact on both performance and efficiency as well. Electronic fuel injection, which uses an onboard ECU and various sensors to precisely measure air temperatures and densities to provide the exact right amount of fuel necessary for optimal combustion. This means that motorcycles can operate in a higher state of tune and provide more power across the rev range. These precise measures also improved fuel efficiency and allowed the fueling to adapt to changing altitudes. The first motorcycle to implement fuel injection in large scale production was the KZ1000 in 1980 from Kawasaki. Around the same time, BMW began popularizing new innovative tech they were able to 
to distill down from their luxury cars. This included both fuel injection as well as ABS. Personally for me, I love fuel injection. I think it's great that I don't have to think about the mixture and it just does it. And every bike I've ever had it has ran with it just fine. So yeah, carburetors, see you later. Win. The first motorcycle to use ABS braking on a large scale was the BMW K100. This sport touring machine was a huge leap forward from BMW's archaic boxer twins and was designed to rival bikes like the Honda Goldwing and the world of sport touring. BMW was able to adapt the ABS system found in their cars and fit it to bikes, but not without some modification. Initially, the ABS system created a lot of noise and vibration in the bike's pedals and levers with the ABS activated, which was less than confidence inspiring if you ask me. BMW engineers designed an electronic and hydraulic mechanism that used a plunger to control hydraulic pressure on the brakes and a ball valve to separate the brake lever from the system. Consequently, this innovation aimed to minimize vibration transmitted through the brake lever. However, initial BMW motorcycle ABS was relatively heavy, contributing to 20 pounds extra on the bike's total weight. BMW's ABS system was continuously improved over the years and other manufacturers began implementing the tech as well. ABS has since become commonplace and practically a rudimentary safety feature compared to the other rider aids found on bikes today. Hell, you can even get a Honda Grom with ABS now. That's how much it trickled down. Fail. Another long forgotten fail of attempted motorcycle innovation is the factory turbocharged bikes from the 1980s that were developed and sold by each of the big four. I love this story so much. We did a whole video about this. Seriously, 1980s turbo bikes, so cool. Turbochargers were all the rage in the 1980s, with many car manufacturers able to make smaller displacement turbocharged engines make power comparable to a larger engine with the advantage of improved fuel efficiency as well. Turbochargers kind of evolved in tandem with fuel injection in the 1980s, as the increase in compressed air introduced by the turbocharger would require a significant change in fueling as well, a situation that is far more complicated to remedy via a carburetor. So, as fuel injection and turbo chargers became seen as a luxury, high-end feature in the automotive world in the wake of impending import tariffs on large displacement engines imposed by Reagan to protect Harley-Davidson from advancing competition, the big four saw turbocharged motorcycles as a possible solution. But it wasn't. Honda sold the CX650T, Kawasaki had the GPZ750 Turbo, Yamaha made the XJ650 Turbo, and Suzuki had the XN85. And while these bikes were cool in a retro 80s machismo kind of way, they flopped commercially. Commercially. The turbo, while creating more top end power under boost, created an awkward power band as a result of the turbo lag, making the power far less predictable than you would want to on the side of the tire. Remember, bikes are supposed to be linear with very predictable throttles because that's your number one connection. So if you're cracking the throttle and you don't know how much power you're going to get and the power all of a sudden boosts, not ideal. These bikes are proved to be expensive as they were costly to produce and more difficult to maintain. After just a few short years, the import tariffs lightened and naturally aspirated engine technology had advanced, and the turbocharged motorcycle idea was scrapped across the board. The only thing we have nowadays are Kawasaki's supercharged models, which isn't quite a turbo, it's a little bit different. Fail. Trying to produce a turbocharged engine has been the only time Honda has failed. It may be hard to believe now, but there was a time in which Honda was continuously innovating and taking risks with their motorcycles. One of their most beloved failures was the Honda CBX. I know, go ahead, scream into a pillow, punch a hole into some drywall, exercise your rage. I understand, I get it. I love the CBX too. Many people do. But you gotta stop and ask yourself, how many six cylinder motorcycles have you seen since its short production window ending in 1982? Exactly. The CBX used a 1047cc inline six that was making 105 horsepower at 9,000 RPM. It was the first motorcycle to make over 100 horsepower, actually. And trust me, an inline six cylinder engine screaming to 9,000 RPM sounds quite unlike most other motorcycles ever produced. But its extra bulk and its more complicated manufacturing were ultimately dwarfed by smaller motorcycles that were becoming more powerful as engine designs progressed. But despite being listed as a fail on this video, the CBX is still a beloved classic and an awesome milestone in Honda's legacy. Fail. It is truly astonishing to think that at one point, people thought rotary engines would be the future of motorcycle manufacturing. Does anybody have a time machine? I will go back in time and tell everybody that the future of motorcycling isn't rotary engines, but actually turbo Hayabusa's. The RE5 from Suzuki was powered by a single rotor engine with a displacement of 497 cc's. The rotary engine design provided smooth power delivery and a unique engine note. Unlike traditional piston engines, rotary engines use a triangular shaped Dorito that moves in a circular motion within a housing. The rotary 
engine delivered around 62 horsepower, providing respectable performance for its time. The smooth and vibration-free operation of rotary engines contributed to a unique riding experience as well. The Suzuki RE5 was produced from 1974 to 1976, and despite its innovative design and technology, the RE5 didn't achieve significant commercial success. The RE5 faced challenges in the market, including its relatively high price, complex engineering, and the unconventional styling that did not appeal to all motorcycle enthusiasts. And again, if you're a motorcycle rider and you service your own bike, you don't want to be working on a rotary. How the hell does it even work? Apex seals? I don't want to deal with that. Additionally, rotary engines, while offering smooth performance, had their own set of engineering challenges. In 1985, Cycle World criticized the RE5 as expensive, overcomplicated, underpowered, and hideous, and they declared it to be one of the 10 worst motorcycles. Win. Despite their epic fail with the rotary RE5, Suzuki actually had some big innovative wins in their tenure, and I'm not just talking about the Hayabusa and the SV650. Suzuki was the first first Japanese motorcycle manufacturer to produce a liquid-cooled engine. Suzuki released the GT750 in 1971. This bike had been nicknamed the Kettle, the Water Bottle, and the Water Buffalo in different parts of the world. This bike used a 739cc two-stroke three-cylinder engine, which was not only the first Japanese bike to use liquid cooling, but also the first two-stroke motorcycle to use a system that collected and burned residual oil and gas to produce visible exhaust smoke. The liquid-cooled system here was used in the RE5 as rotary engines run quite hot and liquid cooling was a necessity. Win. The next motorcycling win comes from motorcycle designer and constructor Antonio Cobas. Cobas is credited with developing what's known as the modern aluminum twin spar frame used in most racing machines and super sport motorcycles. During the early 80s, racing motorcycles continued to utilize steel tube frames that originated from the 1950s. If you've ever seen uh, some American racing from like the 70s, they're chucking around like these giant tubular steel framed monsters. It just looks crazy. As advancements occurred in motorcycle engine and tire technology, the frames underwent increasing stress. In 1982, Cobus introduced a more robust and lighter aluminum twin beam chassis to replace the dated steel backbone frames. This innovation was adopted by prominent motorcycle manufacturers, and by the 1990s, aluminum frame design pioneered by Cobus had become the standard for all major racing teams and Grand Prix technology and competition. Italian designer Fabio Taglioni was also an early pioneer of frame technology, responsible for developing the first Ducati trellis frame used in the Pantop 500 in 1979. From that moment, the trellis frame became one of the key elements of Ducati production. Taglioni is also responsible for developing the original Ducati 90-degree Desmo L-Twin engine. Win. The first ride-by-wire throttle system implemented on a motorcycle was found in 2006 on the Yamaha R6. Ride-by-wire has countless advantages. Ride-by-wire systems allow for precise and instantaneous control of the throttle by translating the rider's input into electronic signals. This results in a smoother and more accurate control over the engine's power delivery. Manufacturers can implement multiple riding modes of the ride-by-wire system, allowing riders to switch between different power delivery characteristics such as sport, touring, or rain modes. This enhances versatility and adaptability adaptability to various riding conditions. Essentially, every safety feature and comfort feature we currently find on motorcycles is possible because of ride-by-wire. We get to have cruise control, traction control, and quick shifters. All of the components that make a modern motorcycle safer and more convenient are easier to implement with a ride-by-wire throttle. And the Yamaha R6 was the first production bike to use a throttle system like this. Fail. And we've got one more motorcycle fail to wrap up today's video. Imagine the most ideal motorcycle you could possibly think of. Probably has a foot forward step through design, right? A six speed automatic transmission, a 670cc parallel twin engine. Then your luck because that's the last bike on the list is the Honda NM4. This bike was referred to as a power scooter. It had forward controls, ultra wide and low handlebar, 50 some odd horsepower, and was fully entombed in plastic bodywork. Nobody wanted this bike. Nobody asked for it. It was sold from 2014 until 2019 and was probably a big old failure and a line item right off for Honda. No thanks. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. What are some favorite motorcycle missteps of yours? Let me know in the comments down below. We'll revisit this topic again. There are so many examples, it was hard to fit all into one video. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all the new content. Head over to yamanu.co and check out the gaming PC giveaway and see all of your options for getting entered. I'll catch you guys in the next one. See you later. Fact, the smell of rain has a name. Petrichor is caused by releasing compounds produced in soil-dwelling bacteria when it rains and is one of my very favorite smells. Goodbye. I'm like a bird, I wanna fly away. I don't know where my soul is. I don't know where my home is. Da -da -da -da. I'm like a bird, I wanna fly away. I don't know where my soul is. Oh, hey. Um, you're still here. Uh, man, this is awkward. You should, um,
fuck. You should keep watching Yami Noob.